warm introduction. I will introduce Giovanni to you in a bit as I set him up to introduce our panelists. And I want to get us right into the intention of today's town hall. Uh, this conversation that Giovanni created for us, that we co-created, Black, Brown, and White, Speaking on the Power of Diversity, Ending Inequality and Injustice in America, has as its intention the creation and sustaining of a conversation that provides an access to ending inequality and injustice in the world. So you're here, not just listening, but you're here participating in the creation of the dawn of a unified, just and conscious America with social and economic structures that work for everyone. Now, causing and sustaining such a society, such a country, just, conscious, and unified is a task that can only be accomplished by those who have the courage to honor the views of those they disagree with. So during this conversation, we will seek to discover the roots of division, the roots of racism and inequality and injustice in our society. We will seek to create the space for the type of dialogue that gives us the opportunity to authentically share our conscious and unconscious biases, the impact of our attachment to our biases and our personal and collective pain. It is our attention that this conversation creates an intimate connection between black, brown, and white, a partnership inside of which we can take personal responsibility for the part we play in perpetuating the status quo. This town hall, this conversation you're engaging in is a bold call to action for individuals to dismantle the and injustice in place. It is also a bold call to action for our institutions governments, corporations, churches, to dismantle the social and economic structures that keep division, racism, inequality, and injustice in place. It is our stand for the creation of a new mental, social, and economic structures that work for everyone. That's what this conversation is. And I'm so glad you're here because your voice matters your opinion matters, your listening matters. And to moderate this conversation with me, I have none other than the number one transformational leadership coach, my friend, my partner, Giovanni Gonzalez, who is also the CEO of Mindful Performance Blueprint, an organization dedicated to the creation of a real difference for the world. Giovanni, go ahead and take it now. Thank you, Sorel. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for kicking us off with the intention of today's conversation. And I'm just going to introduce the panelists today. Uh, I get the distinct privilege to do that. These are unbelievable human beings that I have worked my way in life so I can call them my friends in some way or another. And I'm going to keep working hard so that I can, I can, stay, I can be their friends. So I want to start with Mariela. Mariela Romero, she's a journalist for Univision. She's currently Univision's Communication Regional Community Empowerment Director. Mariela has interviewed former president and Nobel Peace Prize laureate Jimmy Carter, civil rights leader and Presidential Medal of Freedom Award, Reverend C.T. Vivian, and American labor leader Dolores Huerta, among other distinguished public figures. Mariela develops content for special programs, and it is the anchor, writer, and producer of regional news magazine, Conexión Fin de Semana, in Philadelphia, Atlanta, and North Carolina. She has received 23 Emmy Awards from the Academy of Television Arts Southeast Region. She's a superstar, and I'm only reading a few things about her. And it's just, I could go on and on. Thank you, Mariela, for being here. Thank you for being part of this conversation. 
I'm going to introduce now Hans Stewart. This is a man's man. I love this man. He's an Emmy Award winning best-selling author, poet laureate and founder of Walk Against the Call, which is an awareness walk to prevent breast cancer, raising more than $100,000. Hans strong presence in the community afforded him the opportunity to register 15,000 voters. Furthermore, he co-founded the Wendelin Mason and Youth Leadership Development Foundation that has impacted more than 10,000 youth over the course of its existence and has made a significant changes to our youth's health and financial wellness, education, social and community involvement. And that is Hank, so excited that you're here. Thank you for saying yes to be part of this town hall. Sheila James, you know, there is something to say about G Sheila and it'll never be enough. She's the founder and CEO CEO of St. James Media, a company created to empower people, society, and humanity through the empowerment coaching, consulting, and media. She's the author and facilitator of 2020, the next five years, an empowerment coaching series designed for you to create a blueprint and leave an imprint by fulfilling your purpose and realizing your goals. Her lifetime work has been responsible for the transformation of thousands of people from all walks of life. And then there is my man, Zach Knight. Zach started his leadership journey working in the metro Atlanta area as a police officer and SWAT operator. And after seven years transitioned to the role of infantry leader in Afghanistan, where his true test of crime and risk mitigation began, he built from that experience into night protection services where he's able to provide tactical leadership, technical, well, he learned to a wide array of, well, he learns to consult to a wide array of businesses. Panelists, thank you so much for being here. This is a real honor to have all of you in the same room. I know that at some point we're going to be in a nice hotel doing this black, doing this town hall with this conversation and including as many people in a live, in a live studio. Welcome. Thank Good you morning. for being here. I also want to echo your welcome of the panelists and say thank you. And to this conversation in absentia, I also want to welcome everyone of every creed and color of every race. While this conversation is entitled Black, Brown, and White, we mean it to include yellow, red, purple, green, maroon, fuchsia, you are welcome to this conversation. And thank you for being here. Yes, thank you, Sorel. So Sorel, let's get us started with the first question. All right, let's do that. Now, before we dive into these questions, there's a certain listening that I think we, we want to ask the world to bring to the space. And this listening is simply like this. Imagine you have a can a spray can in your hand and you're going to spray it on yourself and on everyone else. And what you're spraying is the elimination and eradication of all guilt, shame, and blame as a part of this conversation. So for the duration of this conversation, let's just do that. Let's play that game of suspending guilt, shame, and blame to create the ability for us to have a conversation that creates an opening where we can start to make a difference in ending inequality and injustice in America. And Giovanni, the first question is, what's incomplete for you? And what we mean by incomplete, it's what hasn't been said that needs to be said about feelings, emotions, and the impact of continual inequality and injustice in America. So we want to give each of the panelists the opportunity to say, what's incomplete for you? And uh, we'll start with Zach Knight. Thanks, Zero. Um, what's incomplete for me, uh, and welcome everybody, what what I'm going to focus on a lot with what's in for me is my background in military and law enforcement. There's a lot happening in regard to those arenas right now. Um, a lot of negativity throughout, especially here in Atlanta. Um, one of the big things of the conversations I've had with Sorrell and Gio here in the last couple of weeks is 
the incompleteness of looking at the true problem within that arena from law enforcement to military and the cultures within a big piece that I would love to focus on more as I move through with my leadership coaching and training with different organizations is focusing on getting the standardization across of law enforcement and having different things toward that entire industry that will focus on pointing out and highlighting the good that actually happens in law enforcement. While I'm no longer a law enforcement officer, a big piece of my background and my love is still in that industry with many friends and people I consider family that are, are being treated certain ways. Currently in military, uh, I had one of the most diverse backgrounds as we responded and helped support protests in Atlanta over the last couple of months. We've been activated in the National Guard for um, COVID, but also the protests in Atlanta. And I had to stand there with the most diverse workforce in the world, in the country, from different races, different backgrounds, different socioeconomic standpoints. And all of us got cussed and sworn at and had things thrown at us because we were wearing a uniform. And what's incomplete for me is that side of the conversation. We're not allowed to speak out when we're in uniform. We're not allowed to say how we necessarily feel from that perspective where we don't necessarily want to be on that side of the line, if you will. You know, there's a line drawn there arbitrarily that we don't choose to have there. We're there in support of the public and support of the community. And unfortunately, we're the ones that become the targets when 95% of us are the ones that are they're out of support and out of love and trying to share that. Um, that is very incomplete. And I hate to see that from our perspective, especially with a very young, young group of young men and women that I had to lead over the last few weeks that have never seen different things throughout this conversation and never been a part of this conversation. And then now they have no voice because it's the first time they've looked at it. And it's really un incomplete for me to see what they had to deal with when they don't truly understand what the conversation is having right now. And I hope that this conversation between all of us will help enlighten that aspect of different things from my perspective inside the construct, if you will. Thank you, Zach. Thank you. And uh, just for a little bit of logistics, each panelist will take roughly one and a half to two minutes to respond to each of the questions so that we may allow time for everyone to speak, as well as allow time for the attendees to ask questions. So, Sheila, you're next. What's incomplete for you? Okay, great, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, what's incomplete for me is that the United States of America was founded as a racist society. This is a theory, and that racism thus is embedded in all social institutions, structures and social relationships within our society society so therefore everything that you know and, and if you find yourself in another race included fine everything that we touch is never yes slavery ended supposedly but it never it's never been acknowledged our contribution to society hasn't been acknowledged the impact on the psyche and the minds of our people has never been acknowledged. It was really, someone said this on Daily Huddle, a mental health issue to some degree. And then it's never been acknowledged over there with white people. So there is an impact and a cost for slavery not being acknowledged. And how do, what do I mean by that? We wrote history books and pretty much excluded it and threw a month in and called it Black History as if that satisfied that we came here from Africa to build this country. We were related to as animals, even on the boat. As I researched, I saw this story where uh, the boat was having a lot of illnesses and sicknesses and the captain of the ship said, well, you know, if you throw the animals over, we get insurance. So maybe if we throw some of the Africans over, we can collect insurance for them. And they, in fact, went to court and the insurance company paid. 
and they threw 113 slaves over the ship so that they could make the journey. What's my point here? It's we're not educated, so we don't know who we are. White America doesn't, not really, some of us do, but they don't know who we are. And then we're not integrated into society. So there's an impact in the cost financially, economically, socially, and down to the core of our own humanity. And if you think it's not in the background of everything, even the way I looked at uh, the Michael Jordan, I can't, the last dance. And when they were talking about, well, it's time to rebuild, the manager was like, no, we got the owner, we got to rebuild the, 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 the team. But he literally was speaking as if those guys were, you know, a slice of beef and you're trying to decide which steak you're going to get. I mean, it's almost in the background of everything. So there's something to drill down into to have an experience, I assert, an experiential transformation, you know, with enough people such that we can impact getting complete. And that's just the piece. I I've got three minutes. That's just the piece of what they complete. But there's so much, the impact on our children. My son is 22. For the first time I got, when I was a kid, we spoke to police. Police helped us to cross the street. All that kind of stuff. My son never experienced that. His only introduction in 22 years of his young life has been uh, police brutality. And he is terrified. And the fear that he has, and the fear that I, as his mother, you know, I'm not complete at night till my son is home or somewhere and I know he's safe and sound and sleep. So there's that end of the spectrum to the, just our own humanity as human beings where we're incomplete, we're not solid, we're not whole, we're not fully related or the possibility of being related to each other in society that we could be. We're not economically sound. Thank you. And, yeah, so I, I can go on and on. <laughs> I know, I know. And you will have an opportunity to go on and on in right. another venue, right? Uh, and now I want to go to uh, Mariela. Mariela, what's incomplete for you? I believe that what is incomplete for me in this conversation is uh, compassion. Mm. Mm. I didn't grow up here. I grew up in different countries, but I come mainly from Venezuela. That's where I was born and I lived there until I was 10 before me moving to Europe. And I, I remember my grandmother when we watched TV together, every time a criminal was caught and in Latin America, it happens that sometimes when the police, they cannot get the bad guys the people, the community, just they just get the bad person or the accused and they start beating them uh, it, you, with the horrible consequences. And sometimes the cameras, the new screws, uh, they, they get those footage. And every time a criminal was caught like that, accused of the most horrible crimes, my grandmother always said, that is the son of someone that is the child of someone. And I think uh, the, the most successful um, uh, social movements that we have had in the history of the world, when you really see change, is because you have love and compassion at the center. Love and compassion for the victims and love and compassion also for the people you accuse, for the, your perceived enemy. Uh, when Giovanni mentioned that I interview Reverend C.T. Vivian, he was there with Martin Luther King. And when I interviewed him, I remember very clearly that he said that at the center of the civil rights movement, there was love. And that's why that uh, movement was successful. I am afraid that we are creating just a revolution and in a revolution everybody pays a very steep price. So I, I think we need compassion and love. Thank you, Mariela. Thank you. And uh, Hank, <laughs> what's incomplete? 
what is complete for you, my friend? And as I'm saying what's incomplete for you, uh, you're speaking for the world, really. Well, first of all, let me just thank you, Sorrel, and you, Giovanni, for creating this platform. It's most needed. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's still late. Um, this, this conversation probably should have been had about 75 years ago, uh, but we didn't have Zoom. <laughs> so we, we couldn't do it. Um, let me just say, I'm not going to say a whole lot because Sheila, Sheila pretty much uh, said most of what I would have said. Uh, what I would say that is incomplete to me is the mere fact that as an African-American, we are created by laws. We are created, if you repealed Emancipation Proclamation, 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, Voters' Right Act, African-Americans are really back in a form of slavery. And so when we look at even this current president that we have, who's constantly trying to undo and uh, uh, turn back the hands, it, 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 what feels incomplete to me is that we are still a, a society of African-Americans who are created by laws. Um, when, when, when President Obama, when President Obama uh, was, uh, was denied the opportunity to put a Supreme Court justice person on the bench, for, for a lot of people, that didn't mean anything. For us, it meant everything. You know, when you look at the, uh, the current president having the opportunity to put two Supreme Court justice people in a, and also appoint over 200 justices around the country, for us, that's devastating because it's conservative judges and a lot of the judges have never set, have never even been on a courtroom before. So when you look at what's incomplete and I go back to being created by laws and then you, the, the, the people who governs the laws have no real interpretation of the laws, we feel incomplete. I feel incomplete. And like Sheila said, you know, I, um, my son is not at the house right now. He's, uh, he's with his girlfriend and, and, and until he gets home to his home or my home or his mom's home, I can't sleep. And, that, and I don't think anybody, I think a, a white child, when they're in their car driving and get stopped by the police, they know that it's something that they've done wrong. For us, we don't, it doesn't necessarily have to be because you did anything wrong. It could have simply been because of the color of your skin. And so uh, we, when I think about, and I'll finish with this, when I think about it, we have more things in common than we have different. When I look at, Giovanni and I look at Sorrel and I look at Zach, you know, we might have different skin colors, but once you take that away, we put our pants on the same way. You know, we bleed the same way. We have, you know, you know pretty much the same organs. You know, we, we have more in common than we have different. And so what feels incomplete is why is our differences so highlighted? Why are they so elevated? Why are they magnified? Thank you, Hank. Thank you. And uh, shifting the conversation just a tad, I'm going to send it now to my co-moderator, Giovanni, to dig into the next question. Giovanni? Yes, thank you, Zorel. Thank you, Mariela, Sheila, Hank, and Zach for, for, for creating for us an aspect of what can be incomplete. And I know that as you were speaking, you definitely were speaking for many who are listening and many who will listen later, you know, because it is a conversation that it leaves a lot of us incomplete in all of the areas that you guys were pointing to. So I appreciate your courage. Now we're going to dive in into a different angle into a question. It's not a normal kind of question, but we want to, we want to dig in a little bit and see if maybe we can get at the source of what could be incomplete and maybe create kind of a shift in understanding it. And, um, and, I, and, and maybe we'll do that, maybe we won't do that, but we we're gonna keep spraying that guilt and shame away from the conversation so we can have it, right? So here's the question. The question is, what could be or what was the point of view that you inherited about other races? Here's what I mean. When you were growing up, what did you hear people around you say about other races? that shaped or could have shaped the social conversation about other races. Now, what you heard while you were growing up may not necessarily be your point of view. And, that is, and it is what people said about other races. So 
what did you hear people around you say while you were growing up about other races? Go ahead, Sheila. You would start with me when I'm all worked up and emotional and stuff. <laughs> so uh, one thing is, you know, I grew up where my father was a minister and went to Morehouse College. Benjamin E. Mays was his mentor. He spent time in our home. Martin Luther King Jr. spent time in my home. Howard Thurman. Uh, back then, they didn't stay in hotels. They stayed in your home. Um, so I heard a lot, first of all. But um, God, I don't know why I'm about to cry. I don't know. This is just driving it all up. But anyway, one is that I was a kid then, and here I am, a fully grown woman, close to retirement, and I'm still having the conversation. But anyway. Um, one, you can't trust white, white people, but white men in particular, you cannot trust them. They will kill their own mother for money, let alone you. Okay. That they love money more than they love God. Um, gosh, those, those are the really big things I heard or, different when they were at the table, at the kitchen table, creating strategies. Sometimes I could just kind of hear, well, no, we don't want to do this because that will trigger that. So there was always some strategy to deal with whatever they were, my, you know, dad or from the pulpit that they were uh, speaking to. And um, they just talked about the hatred they had, the, the white man had for black people and in particular black men. Mm. And that's, you know, I could go, I could say a few more things, but mostly that's, I was just always left with the distrust. And to this day for me, I mean, I've been in a conversation for transformation for 30 years, but there was always a place I didn't go mm. inside of my interactions. Mm. Um, for what I was responsible for in life and my accountability in life and my work. So, but there was always a place where, uh, I'm going to tell you this, but I am actually not going to tell you that because I don't trust it. So it's still something that, that colors and shapes how I am. Yeah. And that's what they said, right? I mean, it's, um, that's what they said while you were growing up. So we're going to yeah. keep spraying no guilt, no shame. So we can see what, was shaping the conversation that we're currently, that's currently molding my behavior, if you will. So, uh, Zach, go ahead. Thanks, Gio. Um, when I was growing up, I, I grew up in Cobb County, for those of y'all that are local here in, in Atlanta, um, South Cobb to be more specific. The area which I grew up in, I was one of the very few white kids in the area. I grew up, best friends were black and Hispanic, and I would be, after school, I'd go to their house, hang out, you know, I'd eat dinner like us family at tables with different races and never thought anything of it. Um, what was interesting was I never outwardly heard anything negative about another race outside of a racial slur or two here and there. You would hear all the older white generation. And when I say older generation, I'm talking born in the thirties and forties that lived through that, that part, that era of the forties, fifties and sixties, you know, you'd hear them use certain slurs, but I never outwardly saw them say anything that I'm going to go. Neighbor's house that were black. I never heard, oh, you can't go over there because this, that, and the other. And when I was growing up, I played t-ball with mostly black kids. I played baseball growing up in, in Smyrna with mostly Hispanics. Um, I never heard anything outside of those racial slurs. I'm not saying it's acceptable by any means, but that's not the context of racism that I grew up with where I didn't even understand what racism looked like until I became a police officer when fingers were pointed at me for being white in a, in an area where a white male is not trusted. And I didn't understand that context growing up where I never saw color. 
just because I grew up around color, whether it's Hispanic or black and never saw that argument uh, anywhere in, in my life, which is interesting given um, obviously the climate that I grew up in and the, the times we grew up in, but it never really affected me to that extent. So I didn't inherit, I feel like I didn't inherit that aspect of things. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and hence, the, you know, the, the woman that you marry, right? I married a very beautiful young black woman. Um, she is quite wonderful and uh, keeps me in check plenty, I promise. <laughs> yeah, I get that. So thank you for giving us an access of, well, what it was like when you were growing up. There were racial slurs, but not necessarily your world, right? And so I get that. Thank you. Hank, what is the point of view that you inherited while you were growing up? Well, I, I got to say this. Fe uh, Sheila is the female version of me. <laughs> she keeps she keeps taking you can you call me before you call her next yes. <laughs> please whatever the question is i don't care if we're asking about what we're going to eat after this zoom call me because whatever sheila says is what i was getting ready to say um it's interesting um I, i'm i'll be 57 september the 4th so i was born in 63 whole lot happened in 63 Mega Evers was assassinated. March on Washington. Bombing of the four little girls. President Kennedy was assassinated. The Equal Rights Bill. Whole, all of that happened in 63. And so for me, growing up, that was a part of what I was insulated in, right? And so for, for my, my family, we were, we, I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. So we were on the north end of Florida, south end of Georgia. My grandmother lived in St. Mary's, Georgia. So we would go and stay uh, in the summers with my grandparents. And what I would hear more than anything, don't you say anything to that white woman. Don't say anything to that white woman. Don't say anything. I can remember my grandfather saying, don't say anything. Don't say anything to that white man. We would have to walk past in a lot of situations because, you know, we, I don't know what we would have said that was incorrect, but he knew and he was always trying to insulate and protect us. And so, uh, you know, growing up, that was forever in, in, in etched in my head. I mean, that was, in, that was engraved. And so for a lot, for, you know, for a long time, you know, I, I wouldn't say anything to Caucasian. I didn't go to school around a lot of Caucasians, Hispanics, uh, the school, the school, the community that I live in was predominantly black. Well, I ain't gonna even say predominantly, it was, it was black. 99.9% .9 black, you know, and, um, and so it was only when I started, when I became a manager at UPS that my community kind of diversify a little bit. And so uh, for me, uh, again, it was just he and my grandparents, it was him, my mom and my dad, you know, and, and just their humility when they were around uh, Caucasians, because it could have impact your economics, right, the job that you was going to keep or lose. And so they were very humble, uh, very proud people, uh, but they were very educated. They were smart. And so they would come back and, and really constantly reinforce. And in my house, and Sheila, would she's going to laugh at this because she probably had the same three pictures. It was a picture of Dr. King, Jesus, and John F. And John F. Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> You're, am I right? Were that's those right. Three pictures? They were, that's they, right. Know, and so, you know, so we, that's, that was our historical lesson. We would, link, we would learn about Dr. King and, you know, of course, uh, religion, and my family, you know, I learned the books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, the Vivians, Dumero, Joshua, Judges, First Seth, Samuel, First Seth, King, First. That was a part of the religious side. Um, but we, but my mom and my and my dad, we had a lot of pride about who we were, at. and so I just remember Hank Aaron hitting the 715, and how our family lit up, and 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 Joe Lewis, and and all of those fights, and you know, it, those were those were pride moments for our family. Um, so I didn't hear a lot of hate. I just heard a lot of pride about who we were. Mm. Thank you, Hank. Thank you very much for opening that up. And Mariela, while you were growing up, what did you hear about other people's races? My first uh, nine years in Venezuela before I moved out of Venezuela, because it really, Venezuela is very, very diverse. Everybody's very mixed. 
in my family, we have the whole rainbow. And I didn't grow up conscious about race and differences, even if I grew up with people who were darker and black, blonde, you know, I never thought that that meant anything. It, 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 I wish I could go back to <laughs> how it was when I was growing up. Uh, and in the moment I got to Europe, that's the moment when I said, oh, having an accent means something. Being from another country means something. Having a skin type means something. Um, I, I, when I was in, in France, specifically uh, in my classroom, there were kids from all over the world. And um, a lot of people from uh, Arabic countries. And you will see a lot of people commenting, having this trust from people from Algeria and other countries. But something interesting happened during that time. I think it has been the most impactful thing that happened in my life. Because during that time, it was 1980, and there were, at that moment in Paris, a lot of exhibitions about the Holocaust. I had no idea about the Holocaust. I was a child. But my parents made the point of taking my sister and I to see all the museums and ex exhibitions and all that. And I remember being shocked and distraught because of the images that I saw of human beings putting other human beings in ovens and killing people. And, and you know, the footage was there. Uh, and, and I remember going home and every night for two weeks, I would go to bed and cry myself to sleep without telling my parents, my sister didn't know, because I couldn't uh, reconcile that I belong to a race of humans that are capable of doing that. I, I, and so every morning during those two weeks, I will wake up and I will ask my mom, what is different about the Jewish? And my mom said, there's nothing different about the Jewish. And I would say, but why did this happen? And she said, there's nothing different. And I couldn't, I couldn't deal with that response. I was trying to find an answer from her, from her that would justify what happened. So I, that blame was not on me as part of the human race. And I now I'm very grateful that she never gave me an answer. Uh, and I grew up in a household with values that um, are like that, where we don't talk about other people in a demeaning way. But you know, that also opened me, myself to, to this reflection. What about if that little Mariela at nine years of age would have heard her mom say, oh, the Jewish, you know, they killed Jesus. They do this. I would have had inherited a point of view. So I, I think that now every time I hear someone with a different, um, you know, with, with racism, et cetera, et cetera, I try to remember when did they learn this? What happened to them that they have that point of view? And I think that is the base that I am proponing for having this conversation around compassion. If we didn't have any programming and then someone just threw um, a concept uh, that was racist in them. Um, it, it, I was lucky. I, I, I think of my mom and I, I think I, I was very lucky. Thank you, Mariela. Thank you so much. And it's so, it's so clear what you're pointing to. There was that moment if your mom would have, if, would have said something that was around the social conversation of the time, it could have shaped, colored, 
the way you would have looked at Jewish for the rest of your life. That's so, that's so true. So, Rel, go ahead with the, our next question. All right. Thank you, panelists. And thank you to all the attendees for hanging in into this conversation. And as the panelists are answering the questions, I'm inviting you, the attendees participating, to, to answer the questions for yourself as if you were one of the panelists. So thank you for doing that. And uh, Hank, I want you to know that I'm coming to you first, buddy. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I put my foot in my mouth. I, 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 I am not going to let <laughs> Sheila steal the show again. Yeah, okay. Sheila, Sheila's <laughs> just, she should have our own Zoom. <laughs> she oh, have all right. Y'all should have did a one-on-one -on -one with Sheila. <laughs> <laughs> so Sorry. here's the deal. There is what you heard, right? And, and I want to throw this in there just so we can all be on the same page. There is what you heard when you were growing up. And inevitably, what you heard people say around you, whether they lived in your household or not, shaped your view of the world. Not only did it shape your view of the world, it actually shaped the way you think plan and behave in life regarding yourself, the people around you, other races, you name it. So the question now is this, how could the point of view you and your community inherited shape the way people in your community, including you, behave with respect to other people of different races? It's a long question, so I'm going to repeat. No, no that's, that's a good one. That's a good one, because I was going to see if I could one. throw that one back in. I, was, <laughs> I wasn't sure if he was going to let me throw that one back in. That's a good one. Um, yeah, so how, how could that, the point of view you inherited impact you? Like, there you are, Hank, you say, your grandfather would say, don't say anything to that white woman. Now, how did that impact you, your community, and the way you behave with respect to other people and other races. But you know what, I think as, as time, Sorrell, great question, thank you for allowing me to have this one up. I think as time progressed and being in more um, diverse environments and things of that nature, uh, it, it changed, it, you know, it, it, it expanded my, and then look, you, you have to remember that was in the 60s, that was in the early 70s, so times were different and we started to evolve a little bit. You know, it helped, moving to Atlanta and you have uh, mentors like a Dr. C.T. Vivian, like a Ms. Anona Clayton, like a Congressman John Lewis or a Dr. Uh, Joseph Lowry or Cameron Madison Alexander or James Orange. I had, I've been really, really fortunate because I had some great people around. And then one, I never forget about three years ago, I had the luxury of going to a guy by the name of Rick Baker's house for a, uh, for a celebration for a young lady by the name of Rochelle O'Neill. And I think a young lady by the name of uh, Mariella was there, you know, and we had an opportunity to converse and, and, and all of a sudden, you know, you know, and, and it's been like this for years, but even then Rick and Mariella and Gwen and so many of us, we start, we, we became brothers and sisters and I, she introduced me to her other brother Giovanni and, you know, and, and, and world, the world just started to change, you know, the world just started to change. So, Here's, here's my answer to that, Sorrell, which I think is a great question, because I do feel like I'm a spirit of influence in my community. I try to be. Now I have the opportunity to bridge conversations in a more diverse conversation with people who I know are great, uh, who are great people, you know, and, and so now we get a chance to look at um, some and say, no, it's not everybody. Here, let me introduce you to Rick Baker. Here, let me introduce you to Mariella. Let me introduce you to Giovanni. Let me, you know, and so people get an opportunity, Sheila, to see other folk who we we uh, hold in high esteem, uh, we, we trust um, yeah. and, and, and bridge that relationship with the camp. So now all of a sudden, you're not boxed in, you're not, your, your, your point of views are not limited anymore. And so one of the things that I'm really excited about is that through our foundation, we get an opportunity to bring in diversity. And, and Mariella has helped us with that. You know, she and I sit on another board together, uh, National Juvenile Defender Center, and it's a very diverse board. And so, you know, it's, it really is, uh, you know, and, and I feel like, you know what, I feel like I'm a um, champion for the common good. Dr. Lowry used to say that. I feel like I'm a champion now. And it is my responsibility. It's my duty, Sheila. It's my duty, Zach, 
to make sure that we forge and bridge these conversations like this mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and help a community that I live in see Mariella different, see Zach different, see Giovanni, see Sorrell, you know, um, they're going to see Sheila. Sheila, Sheila is just, a, she's a star, you know, and she's going to be able to, but we got to, you know, Mariella is a star. You know, every time I introduce Mariella, I talk about her 23 Emmys. You know, because I, I want people wow. to understand. And then we talk about the fact that, um, and, and we, you know, it, it's important, like we're doing a tribute to Ms. Anona Clayton, that Mariella has an opportunity to do that tribute because it shows, and Ms. Clayton loves Mariella, but it shows the world. And every time somebody sees that, that video, it shows that diversity. It shows the world that we live in. So it's my responsibility to do that. I don't right. know if I answered your question, Sorrel, but I'm just so glad I came before Sheila. All right, Hank. <laughs> now, now, Hank, Hank, we're becoming great buddies, so I know I can say this to okay. you. Okay, please. In about 30 seconds, I want you to take us to the time before your extraordinary transformation. Mm. Just take, Look. Take, take us to what now? to the time before your extraordinary transformation. Mm. See, there's a way you see the world now that's juxtaposed to the impact that the point of view you inherited had on your behavior that you have somehow transcended, right? Okay, so, so, so to answer that question, so, Sarah, I don't want to see it. I don't want to see what it. What was it like? Okay, so, so answering that question, I don't remember it. I don't want to remember it. Mm. Because I, I, I like where I am now. Wow. You know what I mean? I don't want to remember, you know, that I, I grew from it, but I don't want to go back and remember it. I want to remember where I am right now because it's, it's a little bit more diverse. And so um, if, if I hang on to that too much, then it might, uh, it, it might make me withdraw. I and got I it. To, I, I like where I'm going right now. That was a good answer. I like that one. <laughs> I, like that, I, like that, I like that answer. Thank you. Uh, hey, you were good, Sir Rock. Try Thank to follow you. that up, Sheila. Uh, he got me on this one. He and, got and, me. And purpose. I like that answer. I don't want to go back. I don't want to go back. <laughs> and purposefully, I'm going next to you, Sheila. <laughs> go ahead, okay. Sheila. Try that. Try All right. Go ahead, Sheila. All right. So say the question Amen. again. I got so caught up in Hank. He was so good. <laughs> so say it I'll again say for the me. question again. How could the yeah. point of view you and your community inherited shape the way people in your community behave with respect to other people of different races? You know, I, I grappled with this when we had our meeting. Remember, I'm still grappling with this question. Um, what I can say is, for me, I had this incident when we were, when I was going from sixth to seventh grade, my family integrated an all white neighborhood. And some preachers in Gary, I'm from Indiana, was calling my dad at Uncle Tom. And um, cause we were moving to this neighborhood and I was so ashamed and embarrassed that my friends heard them call my father this. And it was a big deal for me. So there was that, that was the first moment I think I ever got ashamed of what this was all about. I wasn't clear about it because I was young, but I was somewhat ashamed. And I think that um, I went on to Spelman College and, and honest to God, you go to Spelman, a girl, and you for sure come out a woman, a badass woman. So uh, I think where the shift for me happened was in school because we got trained, we got educated they had the best of the best visiting our campus speaking to us influxing womanhood manhood with morehouse and clark atlanta university so i think for myself with my behavior i became more personally hungry and thirsty for what could make a difference which is how i, how I in fact ended up meeting the two of you you and geo so for me i got hungry about it and I would assert the people in my environment are a lot like a little bit of like minds. While we may have differences of opinions on things, we have like minds in terms of what it is and what it looks like to make a difference. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering that question. Sheila, thank you. 
I appreciate that. And Mariela. Okay, um, I think I am ready to um, say some things that might be, be controversial or is gonna be new and shocking for some people in the, in the audience. But in Latin America, uh, we are a very diverse continent. And then you have the demographics of different countries are, uh, you know, some countries have more indigenous people. Mm. Some have more uh, people who came from Africa. And so you have more black people. Um, and, and, and you have a mixture of that in, in, throughout the, the whole continent and in, in the Caribbean, etc. So depending on uh, the demographics in, in those Latin American countries, uh, there is a, a predominance of, of people on television being wider, being lighter. When I came to the U.S., something that was shocking to me was when they were showing on the Spanish language television commercials with babies that were dark hair and a little uh, brown skin for us, kids who look the traditional Latinos. Because if you go to Venezuela, where 80% of the population is brown and black, you will think that you're in Europe because all those babies are white and all the models are, 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 are very light. And that is throughout Latin America. The same when you go to Mexico or Peru, when you have a lot of indigenous people, they are not represented in television. The people who are blonde, they are the ones. But it's so ingrained that people don't question that when you're living there. It's when you go outside and you start seeing, oh, if they're, this is a Latino TV station and they want to put people who look Latino. Something that happened to me also when I first came here, I was working at CNN and I had a wonderful coworker. She's extremely gorgeous. She's beautiful. She's from Venezuela. And I remember when J-Lo started to become famous and, you know, she had that dress at the, I think it was the Grammys, the, the green dress. And everybody was blown away by J-Lo. And she turned to me and said, I don't know what they see in J-Lo. She's nothing. In our countries, there are hundreds of J-Lo. She's insignificant. <laughs> What, what is shocking to me is that she didn't consider J-Lo beautiful because she looked Latina. For her, a beautiful woman would be like Claudia Schiffer, a German model because she's blonde and she, she, she was also prejudiced against looking more Latinas. Because at that time, before J-Lo, you didn't see a lot of Latinas represented in movies or on television, looking like us with, you know, curves and, and, and stuff like that. So in Latin America, there is a lot of, uh, even though the, the racism is different from the United States, where here in the US, you have to fill form after form and you always have to write what race you are. In Latin America, that, that doesn't exist. You are the, or your nationality. That's what they ask you, what nationality are you? But race is never, never in any questionnaire. So, so you're never aware of what race are you. You're never uh, uh, obliged to identify. But what there is lack in, in, in Latin America is representation of people who look like the majority of the country. Wow. And that is something very shocking. <laughs> I, I believe for, for many people. Yeah. Well, those uh, behaviors that stem from what we inherit, whether as individuals or as a society, they take different forms and that's the form they take on Correct. TV. That, 
Will you round up that question for us? As long as you don't put me behind all these other great answers, because, uh, <laughs> man, um, you know, I, I want to kind of circle back to what I grew up with and when I first started racing and the way that shapes our viewpoint from the law enforcement and military side toward other races and community where my wife and I met at the police agency we worked for. Um, it's interesting. She came from Minneapolis and I'm sure everybody's aware of what's happening in Minneapolis right now. Um, I came here from Atlanta where I didn't see that racism. Like I said, till I got into law enforcement um, and I started understanding the context of the question a little bit differently or the context of the situation a little bit differently. I remember the day everything happened or started to happen in law enforcement from Ferguson to New York to things that happened in Atlanta, Minneapolis, all of these things hit me very personally where I never thought it would happen in Atlanta. I'll be honest. We have such a diverse community here in Atlanta. I never thought in my early police years that I would ever see that mentality towards a white police officer. And my, my training officer was black. The people I served next to in the military there, I have black, Hispanic, Asian, you name it. I've cried next to these guys, these gals. Um, and we've shared some great triumphs and we've shared some very low lows and I'll tell you, the thing that got me out of law enforcement was when I made a traffic stop, not a block from the baseball field I grew up playing ball on. And I stopped, it happened to be a car full of young black teenagers. I walk up to the car and all of them put their hands up and said, please don't shoot us because we're black. And I thought, I honestly thought I heard wrong. And there's somebody in the back seat that said, I look back, I'm like, I'm sorry, what'd you say? And it was a young, young female teenager. I can see all four of their faces so clearly. She said, please don't shoot us because we're black. And it took me so far aback that I did not, I didn't understand, didn't process to me. I'm like, why would I shoot you because you're black? It didn't process to me because I didn't see that. And it bugged me so bad that my own community would look at me in that fashion. I'm a bald white guy that's a cop. I literally joined that to serve. I want to be of service to the city I grew up in. I want to be of service to the nation with the military. And to have that looked at me and lumped into that took me so far, hit me so, broke my heart. Long story short, it broke my heart. I was out of law enforcement within a year because I didn't like being correlated with that populace. Um, it's interesting. My wife and I have had these conversations over and over again. And she said she never saw racism until she came to Atlanta and became a police officer. She granted she is light skinned. She said that she did not outwardly have any racism towards her in Minneapolis. But when she got to Atlanta and became a police officer, she was called a traitor to own her own people. I've seen some of my black soldiers be called traitors because they're in uniform and they're on the wrong side of the line the inherited conversations that we've all had from our parents and granted no offense to Hank. I'm a, my, my mom's about your age, Hank, sorry. Um, so I'm a little bit younger generation where I think our conversation has been a little bit different. We're a little bit farther removed from <laughs> things that happened in the sixties and seventies. Sorry, Hank, I had to. Um, <laughs> I'm all right with it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just, it, it's interesting to me where I never understood that conversation and it pushed us so far. I've had soldiers quit the military because they don't want to be associated with their pride in uniform as traitors to their own people. My wife is out of law enforcement now because she didn't want to be associated as a quote unquote traitor to her own people. And that's the view that I think a lot of people don't see is I would consider my wife and I great, great upsetting citizens that wanted to serve our community for the right reasons that got run out of that culture because we were lumped into I'm white or you're a police officer. So you inherently must be bad. And that's part of the conversation that is also incomplete for me is the majority, the majority want to be of service. We want to give to our community. 
We want to be part of solving the problem. And I've had to leave law enforcement to get outside the construct to now have a leadership company where it's called Be a Tactical Leader, where I actually teach organizations how to be tactical in their leadership in diverse communities as I'm learning more and more through the military of how to be a leader in a diverse community. And I hate having that perspective toward those in uniform. And I wish that part of the conversation, there's a little bit more empathy towards that, the ones that are truly there to serve and do well and right in the community. Zach, perfect segue into the next question that Giovanni is going to moderate. Uh, we're at 4.02 and we want to leave enough room for the attendees to ask you questions. So uh, in the next segment, uh, Giovanni and I are going to keep our panelists down to one and a half minutes. Okay. That probably will end up being three minutes for you, Sheila. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, Giovanni, take us to the next question, please. What Very does the hold? Very good. Thank you, Sorrel, and thank you all of you panelists for being so vulnerable and opening something up. And as I'm reading some of the questions that are here on the Zoom from the attendee, attendees and also uh, as, as you guys are speaking, things are showing up for people, right? So I appreciate the vulnerability and I appreciate that people are kind of jumping in and say, well, this is not being talked about. This is not necessarily being said, right? And that's precisely what we're having this conversation. Certainly, we're not going to be touching on all the things that we want to say. And so therefore we will continue this conversation. And of course we'll include other races and people from different backgrounds to join in and because we gotta hear each other. So the last question before we go to Q and A is, so what does the future hold? So we're going to, we have dived into three questions. What's incomplete for you? The point of view that you and others have inherited and the way the inherited point of view shaped the way you and others behave towards other people, right? Now, here's the question. Assume that you have a magic wand, or for example, you are the governor of the state of Georgia, for example, right? What actions would you spearhead to unify America? And we'll try to keep it within one minute and a half. Um, go ahead, Hank. Okay. Well, you know, it's, it's the future is very bright. I've had an opportunity, and I'll say this real quick. I've had an opportunity to participate in probably about seven protests, march, demonstrations. And what has moved me, Mariella, is the diversity of the group. I was at one yesterday. I, pro I protested right across from the Capitol at Liberty City, and it was for uh, Black Lives Matter in education. And, and the, group of un uh, the group of educators were just as many Caucasian, Hispanic, uh, male, female, it was very diverse. And so I've been in probably seven demonstrations, protests, march, whatever, and they've all been very, so the future is bright. I think, I think this is, this is, I'm, I'm more optimistic and I'm loving the youth, our young people. I'm, it's mm -hmm. just really motivated me. Um, so I think the future is bright. Hank, as you look at the future, right, and being bright, right, as, as you're pointing to it, and as you look at all the places where you have been and all the places that you're allowing yourself to be, Right, and I know this is kind of a big question in some way, but if you put it all together, what actions would you steer ahead to unify America? Could you? To, 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 keep, to keep our young people in the room together because they're figuring it out. Um, it, seem, it seems like anybody over 50 is the ones messing it up right about now. The young <laughs> people have figured it out and, they, and because again, these marches are very diverse. You know, they're, you know, across, so they got this social media piece down. They're, they're political. I was at the Capitol. They're around there talking about bills that they want to see repealed or a push. The hate crime bill was pushed because of the young people. Uh, you know, so anybody over 50 needs to shut up, really. Uh, well, I'll go back. Uh, Maria, how, how old are you? 49. Zach, Zach. <laughs> I'm turning 50. <laughs> Zach. I'm 31. Anybody over, anybody 31 and over need to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all the young people. It's the young people, so, but uh, I, you know I'm, I'm excited. I'm, I'm excited about the diversity of what I'm seeing. I promise you, if you go to my page, I think Mariella I tagged you and Rick on it. You can see the diversity, and I was narrating the diversity was beautiful. It was beautiful. So 
uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I, I think I w what I would do is would put them in the room, give them the tools they need, and and, and back off. If they ask us for anything, like having a conversation with Dr. C.T. Vivian, yeah, put love in the middle of that. You know, you know, put put hope, put diversity. I would throw a couple of little words out there, but for the most part, they're figuring it out, and they've got more done since our Ahmad Avery's, you know, uh, mm -hmm. killing to now. I've seen more laws and legislation passed and changed and moved. Looking at the, the, the uh, not, you said 30 seconds, I'm sorry. I'm thank you. Yeah. No, thank you, Hank. That was beautiful. That's thank you for saying what you said. It was powerful, man. You just get people in, in the conversation and just let us, you know, walk away for a minute and let them do it. Um, go ahead, Sheila. All right. So a couple things that I see. The future, I think, is very bright. I think this is a new moment in time and we want to seize the opportunity. What we don't want to do is leave anything out. So a couple things, I think it's the police reform, but it's criminal justice. There are laws, there are different things we want to see to it. We got to see to it, this happens and it happens now. The excessive sentencing and transitioning people, men, women and children powerfully out of the system education we've got to reform education we must the scholars we must write history not rewrite because it's never been told we must write history and tell the truth and shame the devil all of it nothing left out ending poverty and disempowering conversations that are in our communities in all communities and in the world uh, so i see we taking actions in these areas to get some of these things corrected economic reform, Robert Johnson, billionaires talking about, you know, $17 trillion in reparations. What I didn't see about it before is crystal clear to me. That is an appropriate action, economic reform, an agenda for it, uh, which could be economic inclusion, or we begin to withdraw that. And I think too, the young people, you got to make room for the young people. And the last thing I want, oh, civics and citizenship. So if we hit those areas, I think those areas are big enough to have other areas open up. Um, the last thing I want to say is Pastor Mike says, you know, it's going to be big. And it's going to be so big. And this is like that I get to see this in my lifetime is a miracle. So thank you for having me here. Sheila, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sheila. And Zach, what actions would you spearhead to unify America? You know, I'll have to piggyback off what Hank said. I think this younger generation is, is getting it right. Um, and I'm speaking in the military and in law enforcement specifically. Um, they're seeing and doing things that the older generation that trained me didn't understand and didn't see. And I'm talking black, white, or Hispanic. And seeing this new generation come in, um, they are open to these conversations that we're having right now. And when we talk about, um, Sheila mentioned law enforcement reform, I would also agree that one of the things I am spearheading, trying to spearhead, trying to be a part of, the conversation I'm trying to be a part of, is the standardization of law enforcement across the training, the actual department to department standards being the same where you can point to misconduct a lot easier because it's not within the standard that's actually in that construct. Cause that's not there right now from city to city, state to state. It's completely different from different departments. And that would be my big piece is trying to get everybody on the same page. So we can really highlight when something like Minneapolis happens and it's very blatantly outside of any actions that are permitted. Thank you, Zach. Thank you so much. And before we go with Mariela, those of you who are listening and listening only, go ahead and raise your hand, whether you're on your phone or whether you're on your computer, if you have any questions for any of the panelists or for all of them in some way, and we will unmute you when, we, um, when, when it's your turn. Go ahead, Mariela. Um, I believe that some actions are already happening um, I believe corporate America has a big, big role in, in play, to play here. Uh, they have to foster uh, inclusiveness in the workplace to attract the diversity that we want to see. 
Um, you know, I'm a big proponent of, of cultural mastery in uh, the workplace. Uh, people from different sides of society learning, um, you know, having a different cultural mindset and develop cultural skill sets is going to be the game changer for this country and, and for the world. You know, we are, Black Lives Matter was born in the U.S. and we are seeing a movement around the world and, and people are asking why? Because we don't have the same history, but the treatment of Black people around the world is the same. So, you know, that, that is resonating for a reason. The other thing that I, I, I am very, very excited is, I see it as very positive, is representation in the media. Uh, we are seeing a lot of series and uh, you know, TV shows where uh, the characters of diverse background are not the stereotypes. You see a Hispanic surgeon, a black attorney, and you know, things that we didn't used to see before um we are changing uh that narrative also in representation i'm a big proponent of representation in the media and uh not only in fiction but we have to bring that to uh the newscast where we have a more diverse newscast as well when we have more people represented uh you know also, sometimes when we are of a minority background, one of the things that happens when you see in a newscast that, uh, you know, they arrested someone that is Latino, we have so very few representation that we cringe because it's like, oh my God, when a Latino is on TV, then it's going to be the, the drug bust. Um, so I think uh, changing the way we see uh, diverse populations represented in, in television is, is a big way to change the country and to change the narrative. Mm, thank you so much, Mariela, for including all of it. So this is what going to be our, our, maybe our favorite part of the conversation in one way or another, so we can include everybody's question as well. As we unmute you, we're going to start with you, Michelle. As we unmute you, Michelle, Go ahead and ask the question, be as concise as possible, and let us know if there's a person in specific that you want to ask the question to. Go ahead, Michelle. Okay, yes, hello, can you all hear me? Yes, yes loud and clear. <laughs> Thank you for taking the question. I'm a little bit driving. Thank you for having the town hall. Um, and, I, and I suppose my question would be for the officer because um, I do have several friends who are officers. I mean, I know them well. I know their homes, families. I know their children have um, served in community projects with them. And yet I am one of those people that have been so traumatized and so afraid as an African-American black female to be on my own driving multiple times being stopped in 2014 situation in 2017 being stopped i do not smoke weed never have don't smoke anything not an abuser of alcohol and so to have been stopped and arrested and put in jail and have five caucasian officers beat me down and keep me in jail overnight things like that and then 2019 myself having guns pulled on me because i hesitated a little bit but i cut on my hazards and pulled over to the right but to have all of these cops all of a sudden surround the car and draw guns on me, I would have been another George Floyd. I would have been another hashtag because I almost didn't make it into 2020. And so I'm asking the officer, um, just from a mental health perspective, I mean, I believe that officers should get that vacation pay. They should get that mental health day. Are there systems being put in place now for the future to say, hey, you know what, if, if I'm at a place in my job where I've gotten so overwhelmed and so stressed out, is there mentally being put in place for them? Is, is there something being done to really help them de-escalate those situations? Because it's getting to be so much and it's so hard to have to even think about I can't, I, I, I get so stressed out trying to go anywhere and COVID has given me time to get in Zoom and learn some things and do some work from, from home. 
but it's hurt to be so afraid to even get in my car. So I'm asking that from a mental health perspective, what you see in that for the future. And then also from the second part of the question is just, as far as the money, I don't think it's right. Too many innocent people are getting caught, caught in the crossfires. We know certain people have issues with drugs and the police are called and whatever, but people are working hard, job, work, school, going back and forth home. And, and we get, because this officer has a certain quota, he's got to meet. He's getting all these, this thing coming down from mayor's offices and all these quotas from the state where you got to make so many arrests. And some of us are resisting the fact that, hey, legally, we're being told that we can peacefully um, resist an unlawful arrest. How do we do that respectfully? We comply, we're complying, and we haven't done anything, and too many innocent people are getting caught in, caught in the crossfires. So how do we combat that? How do we stop the system from just finding everybody because we've got to make money from these fines, and so we just got to stop people all the time and pull them over for just ridiculous reasons? So two of those questions, the mental health and then the fine is the money game, the Thank money you. game question. Thank you, Michelle. Zach? Thanks, Michelle, for the question. Um, those are two very, very big questions that I'll try to be as concise with my answers as I can. And I, I'll open this to everybody. If you want to talk with me offline, I will very much continue any conversation you want, just given out of respect for the time that we have today. Um, for mental health, there is not enough done. I was involved in uh, shooting in law enforcement. I've been involved in different things in the military that had high stress for over a decade now. Um, the, from the time I left Afghanistan to the time I got back on my sofa was five days. And law enforcement follows suit of what the military puts in place. So I will tell you there is very, very little done to help the de-escalation of a, an individual police officer or military member. There's just not, there's too much pride. There's too much arrogance in the industry to keep from that, which is really where a lot of our issues come from. The police administration is still that older, older generation where the millennial and younger generation hasn't stepped into administrative roles in law enforcement yet. So I think you will see a change coming, which leads me into the answer for the money game. Um, question part of the question that will also change in the future the generation that i started policing with and younger is moving more into a community-based policing where there's never been an official quota but i can tell you there are unofficial quotas called productivity quote unquote um, where you're expected to go out and engage in some sort of law enforcement lit to the literal term of enforcing laws like traffic offenses. Um, I, I feel like that is moving out of that space as the younger generation gets more integrated into this space. Um, so I ask, give it time for this younger generation to move into that leadership role, and I think you'll see a huge difference. Thank you, Zach. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, Michelle, for the question. And, and you know, as Michelle was speaking for so many people, so thank you, Michelle, for opening up. So the next one is Karina, and Karina, as you um, as you ask the question, if you don't mind being as concise, so we can get as many other people as we can. Go ahead, Karina. There we go. Okay, great. Um, well, first of all, I, I got so lost in the last person's like commentary and question that like I think I lost my original question, but I'm going to go for it. Um, <laughs> so um, first of all, um, Mariella, I just loved what you said about feeling for other people. I am a white Jewish woman, and inside of all the conversations we have about human destruction, I do think about the Holocaust and all of that. So I appreciate your bringing that into play, and. <laughs> Sorry, Zach, but I guess my question really actually goes to you. Um, I keep seeing all of this, you know, for years with all of this with the shootings. And um, I have a friend who's also a police officer. She's a black woman. She's actually retired now. And I got into a, and, and my question is like, how do I even say this? But like, my understanding is the training is like to shoot to kill. And what I keep seeing over and over again is like, can you just not shoot somebody's knee? They're not gonna come get you with the knee. 
bleeding and broken or whatever. You know what I mean? Like shoot their elbow, right? Like that's what just keeps coming to my mind, um, whether it's a young child or it's an adult, you know, and I shared with you in the chat, you know, I, I, I've been surrounded by police cars by being a passenger, you know, in a car with a person who's not white, my boyfriend, right? And it's, it's a scary feeling thinking that you have no, um, no right when you're standing there with this person with a gun. And so when I just keep seeing, like, I see the first change, if there was any change to happen out of this, is like, can the training be retrained? Like, just shoot the damn knee or something, right? Don't shoot the body. So do you think that that's possible? <laughs> I'm going to give a probably very unpopular answer to this. Speaking from, I would assume, no other law enforcement officers in the room. If there are, please raise your hand. Um, the, there is a fallacy attached to shoot to kill. That is never something I've ever heard once in my entire career. Not military, not law enforcement. It is shoot to stop the threat if that is needed. Now you see tasers be employed more because that'll stop a threat pretty effectively. Um, but you're trained to shoot to stop the threat. Your reason you're trained to shoot, as we call it, center mass, the chest, the abdomen area, is because that's where you're most likely to actually hit somebody if they pull a gun on you. And I'll tell you, I've been shot at more in Atlanta than I was in Afghanistan. And shooting somebody's elbow or shooting somebody's knee is – a very difficult concept under high stress. That's why you're taught to shoot toward center mass to stop a threat. And I'll tell you the only times I've discharged my firearms is in defense of somebody else's life, never my own. So if somebody is holding a gun toward their spouse and mind you, I have a domestic violence nonprofit, in support of domestic violence victims that my wife and I run. So I take domestic violence very seriously. If your boyfriend were to put a gun to your head and threaten your life, would you expect me to shoot for his knee? Or would you expect me to shoot to stop the threat of your life being taken from you? And that's the training that we're given. It is not shoot to kill and it's not a popular answer, but the reality of it is in order to save your life, Karina, I would shoot for a shot that is, has a higher percentage of actually hitting. All right, thank you for that question. Our next question is coming from Ken Robinson. Ken, go ahead. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. Uh, it's been a great session so far. Uh, I guess this question really is to everyone and uh, that includes Giovanni and yourself, Sorrell. So inside of this conversation, I'd say there are forces for um, progressivism, and there's forces for the maintenance of the status quo. We want to keep the system exactly as it is. We don't want to change. We don't want to change. And that's really a big, um, uh, the big, you know, underneath everything, that's a lot of what I see going on. So given that, what's the impact on this conversation for having those voices that want the status quo absent from the conversation because i think there's one common thread i hear among all of the speakers here is that you are voices that are standing conversation that includes people that are not progressive what's the impact of them not being here and, and what are some of the effective conversations you all have had to be able to move people more from a, uh, a maintenance status quo to a progressive conversation well, that really is to anyone so I, I'll, I'll jump in on that one real quick. I think the more you pull people who are not progressive into conversations like this has an opportunity to at least change their mindset. Uh, the mm -hmm. more you have to be t intentional. I think you have to go after people who want status quo, right? And put them on a panel with Cyril and G Giovanni and Sheila and Zach, you know, and, and put them in a, in a position to be heard and hear other folk. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that answer, uh, Hank. And uh, Ken, I'm about to give an un unpopular answer to your question. Uh, your question assumes that I am actually enlightened and that I am for something progressive. And that's probably where my demise as someone who stands for the end of injustice would begin. 
Uh, I'm inviting myself and all of you to consider that the ones who are not for this conversation are actually in the conversation right now. So uh, maybe, just maybe, mm. there's room for me to consider that I'm not as progressive as I think I am and that I really need to be in this conversation. And the more I can see where the conversation I inherited gives me a behavior I can't even see, then the more compassion, as you're saying, Mariela, I may have for someone who has a different point of view that I would then label or blame as not being progressive. So uh, can that's my view and my take on your question and my invitation, my request that uh, we consider ourselves all <laughs> unenlightened. And uh, I, I won't even go uh, as far as saying uh, I'm the one, but inside of that collective conversation, we all, including myself, have some responsibility to bear. Uh, Ken, thank you for the question. Anyone else wants to take a cut at it? We've got three minutes left. Yeah, I will. Well, I'll say something real quick, Sorel. Um, and, and Ken, thank you very much. And I was, I was actually leaning on the way you answer the question, Sorel, because um, in the last, what, four or five weeks, uh, my, I, have had, I have come to terms of how not progressive I am. And it's been a, a real, uh, something really difficult for me to, to deal with, Ken, given that um, I lead transformational courses and I am out there with people and I grew up in Belize. And, you know, like, let me tell you, I'm going to call myself out a little bit. I really didn't have much interest in the whole voting, for example, system, given the electoral college and all of that. I was like, oh, okay, you know, I'm just going to lead courses. Not very progressive, you know what I mean? And then uh, I was looking at the movie uh, Selma the other day from Martin Luther King, and I was like, Oh my God, would I have gone back to that bridge? Uh, highly unlikely. <laughs> so that moved me inside of me, right? And then, you know, I was in a room with Sheila 10 years ago when she said, you know, the silent majority are the ones that I'm trying to speak to, you know, like from a letter from Latin, Martin Luther King. And I never really got that until 10 years later when I saw myself as a silent majority saying, yeah, go, go, you go, Hank, you're awesome. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not very much progressive. So this conversation is for me, and I have been moved in this conversation by Zach, by Hank, by Sheila, by Mariela, right? And so uh, I just wanted to add that in the, in the mix. Uh, thank you, Cyril, for kicking that, kicking that for me. Well... This certainly isn't the first or the last conversation we're going to have uh, on the subject. Uh, I'm immensely grateful for your participation. It is 429. Thomas Skaggs, I'm going to let you squeeze the last minute and then we'll take your question and give each of the panelists an opportunity to give their last words along with addressing your question and what they're saying. Thomas, go ahead. Yes, um, I ran through several questions and I got the most important one, I believe, that's going to be the benefit of all parties involved for healing. And the question is simple and straightforward, like I like to live my life. How can we change the views of people when they're unwilling to take action to create diversity and lasting peace amongst all people. And Thomas, before our panelists say their last words, I'd love for you to rephrase that question and say it in the first person. Will you do that for me, please? Okay, how can I, as an individual, change my views if I am unwilling to take action 
that creates lasting diversity and peace for everybody. I got that, Thomas. And that's where transformation begins inside of this conversation. Yes. And every one of us. Thank you for your question, Thomas. Thank so, you for the Lonnie, let us create the space for our panelists to say their last words. Right now, all I want to do is shower everyone, the panelists included, and you with love and appreciation for creating the space for this conversation. Mm. So, your last words. Mariela, we'll start okay. with you. Okay. Uh, well, I think my, my last words would be <clears throat> never underestimate the power that uh, we have when we are vulnerable and we show our humanity. When we have those tough conversations, uh, and this I learned from Giovanni, uh, be willing to say, I don't have the truth. I am not right. This is what I want to share. That intention of being humble and showing your vulnerability um, opens the world for the other person that you're having a discussion with. Mm. And, and I think it is important for all of us to take that responsibility of uh, trying to foster the change that we are we want to see in the world it is all of us it is going to take all of us to engage in the conversation um, and just not approach it like i am right you're wrong say i don't have the truth i just want to have a, a talk i just want to have a conversation and that is very very powerful and i want to thank giovanni for opening up that world for me. Mm. Thank you, Mariela. And I acknowledge your courage, Mariela, to step into that world. Thank you for your love and your compassion. Thank you. Sheila. Yeah, I just first of all want to say thank you for the opportunity and for the everybody on the panel it was extraordinary. It was great. And um, we really do have an opportunity. For me, it really is a new moment in time, and I'm privileged to, get to be a part of it. Um, to our young people, as Hank pointed out earlier, you know, don't stop. We're here as resources. Um, and I think that we do have to bring compassion and love and humility and honor and dignity to this conversation. Uh, the last thing that I want to say is one of the that I work my business from and live from is connectivity. Who I am that we have everything. Conversation, the six of us got connected. Everyone else who listened and is listening and will listen got connected. So let's keep connecting ourselves and getting it done. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you. You're welcome. Zach, your last words. Thanks, Earl. Um, Thomas, that's a big, huge, powerful question. And it's something that I think everybody that attended and was on this panel today is trying to achieve. I think we're all part of this conversation. We're continuing. Um, one thing that I've learned throughout military, police, business now is it's nearly impossible to change somebody else's mind without first being willing to change your own. Mm. And I think a very big piece of the conversations we're having needs to engage in active listening where I have to open my mind to Sheila and Hank who very well may have very different perspectives of law enforcement than I do. But until I can open my mind to what they have to say about their experiences, just like what Michelle shared with us, I have to open my mind to that and be willing to hear their side. But I also think that is both ways where we have to have that objective, active listening conversation in order to continue that. And that's what I encourage everybody to do within their own cultures, where they are, whether it's military, law enforcement, their own workplace, maintaining these conversations with active listening, not preparing a response, but preparing to listen to what somebody's truly trying to portray to you. 
Thank you, Zach. Hank? Well, you know, I, I, immediately I thought about Dr. King's quote, in the end, I remember not the voice of my enemies, but the silence of my friends. Mm. I'm going to say it slowly again, Thomas, because I think this is where you are. In the end, I remember not the voice of my enemies, but the silence of my friends. Mm. And so we have got to get to a point where all of us, you know, it, you know, I, I, with my foundation, I tell a lot of my young people, you know, if you can't change the crowd that you're in, then change the crowd that you're in. And so if we can get people to start changing their crowd, if you stop hanging out or not you particularly, but if we stop hanging out with folk who are not doing the right thing, that crowd gets really small. Um, and so, you know, I'll, I'll end it, you know, leave, follow, or get out the way, leave, follow, or get out the way. So if you stand Amen. with us, stand with us, you know, and, and people will see, they'll come around. Well, if we, if leadership, and we're seeing a lot of that now. We're seeing a lot of that leadership now, even at the NFL and some of the moves they've made. And, you know, uh, we saw um, Drew Brees' teammates call him out. We, we've seen some some changes. And, and so we've got to be willing to call out injustices. And and I think we'll, we'll get better. So, again, in the end, I remember not the voice of my enemies, but the silence of my friends. And so if you're my friend, stand with me. Vote with me. <laughs> Vote with me. Vote, vote, vote in a way that helps everybody, helps mankind. So, thank you, Hank. I got my voter pen on, so I keep my voice. <laughs> Giovanni, your last words, my friend. Thank you. Gio, are you here? Yeah, I'm right here. Thank you, Sorel, and thank you, panelists. And all I really want to do is just send you all so much love. And, and, you know, each one of you panelists, I just want to take my time, another 45 minutes just to love you, right? Thank you all the attendees for being here. I love you for being here. Thank you for making this conversation your conversation. And I, I just can't, I can't thank you enough because I know that you'll take it to the dinner table. You'll take it to as far as you can with the friends, right? Who have never really seen, like myself, the opportunity to just create more town halls out there and listen to the voices of people with the different color of skin, right? Different background. So that is it for me, Sorel. I love you, Sorel. Thank you for being my partner in crime in this whole thing called transformation. It really takes something. Yeah, it does. And, uh, and fortunately, we've got 23 attendees and the four panelists who are actually engaged in this conversation and engaged in this quest with us. So uh, I leave all of us with uh, these words. Uh, this town hall is a bold call to action for you to dismantle the mental structures that keep division, racism, inequality, and injustice in place. It is also a bold call to action for the institutions in which we work, play, and participate our governments, our corporations, our churches, there we have the power to dismantle the social and economic structures that keep division, racism, inequality, and injustice in place. Our stand, and thank you for standing with us, is for the creation of new mental, social, and economic structures that work for everyone. Your voice matters. Speak out. Mm. Your opinion matters. Express it. Your listening matters. Give it generously. I, I love all of you. I can't wait for the next conversation. You'll hear of it. When you hear of it, spread the word and flock to it. Welcome home. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, Hank. Awesome weekend. <laughs> but Hank, I'm going to wait right. for my phone call, Hank. Hey, Hank, I want a phone call too now, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good night, everyone. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. See you later, Hank.